Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM. My name is Pete, and after a bit of a vacation break, today we complete another episode of our XCOM Enemy Within Iron Man Impossible walkthrough. In the last episode, we completed the unique side recon mission in Canada, we saved a small fishing village from a chrysalid infestation, and in doing so, we unlocked the Zombie Gone achievement. That mission was also quite lengthy, so we didn't really get to do a lot of base management, so that is probably what we're going to start with today. For the time being, we don't really have anything to take care of, but we're only one day away from the completion of the Skeleton Suit Research Project, so let's start scanning and hopefully get there in just a few seconds. And there we are, the Skeleton Suit is unlocked and with that we now have access to a brand new type of armor. It offers a little less protection than Carapace armor, but comes with a grappling hook and a movement speed increase, so all things considered, it is definitely an upgrade. Now we'll discuss what to do with this technological advancement in just a few moments, but for now we can focus on our next research project, and that will be heavy lasers. Because we completed the sectoid interrogation, we get a research credit for this one, so it will only take four days to complete, and it will provide us with upgraded weapons not only for our heavies, but also for mech troopers as well as our fighter jets. Because of that, it is definitely a very impactful project, so let's get working on it right away, and then we can continue scanning. Better depth perception and visual processing will allow our soldiers to take greater advantage of elevated firing positions. And there we are, our first gene modification on Sniper Resilius Wargal is complete. As I have explained before, for achievement purposes, we want everyone in our squad to have at least two gene modifications. So after completing the first one here, Resilius will be sent right back into the gene lab. And the mod we're going with is Adrenal Neurosympathy, a modification that triggers once the soldier gets a kill on the battlefield, and Resilius does that quite often. And once it triggers, it gives bonuses to aim, critical hit chance and movement speed of all nearby soldiers. So once Resilius rejoins the squad, we should be able to use this at least once or twice per mission, and for the price of 25 credits and 10 units of meld, it is very much affordable. I'll have the selected volunteer sent to surgical prep immediately. Once the genetic modification is complete, I will notify you directly. So once again, Resilius will spend the next three days in the labs, and we can continue scanning. And with that, the next research project is completed as well. We now have access to heavy lasers. And as you can see here, this unlocks quite a few interesting things, but arguably the most important unlock here is the heavy laser for our heavy class soldiers. Especially the more shooting-oriented Shoji will definitely benefit from this, as this weapon gives him a very solid damage increase. Here then we have the Foundry Project, a laser cannon for the heavy weapons platform. However, at least for now, we have pretty much ignored this vehicle in this playthrough, but in true completionist fashion, we will get to it eventually. The laser cannon then is a weapon upgrade for our fighter jets. It is not that much of an upgrade compared to the Phoenix Cannon, but it is the first aircraft armament we have unlocked that actually has a bit of armor penetration, and against some of the bigger UFOs in the game, that can certainly be of use. Lastly then, we have the Railgun, and this is the weapon upgrade for the Mech Troopers. Just like with the Minigun, the average damage output of this weapon is a bit higher than that of the other laser weapons in the game, so once we have bought one, Mech Trooper Mahoney will be an even more deadly killing machine. And so, we once again have a new project to choose, and we're going with one that has been sitting here for quite a while now, the UFO Power Source. This project is vital for three very important things that we definitely want to have in the mid to late game. Among them is a brand new type of fighter craft, but completing it also unlocks another upgrade for our mech troopers, and it gives us access to a brand new and much more powerful power generator. So let's get to it, completing this will only take six more days, and with that we can now head over to engineering and purchase a few of those weapons we just unlocked. First of all, we want to grab ourselves one railgun for mech trooper Nicholas Mahoney, and then two heavy lasers for Andrea and Shoji. The total cost for this will be 85 credits and 51 alloys, but thankfully, for the time being, we have enough of both. Now, for the cost of 10 credits and 7 alloys each, we also want to purchase 5 laser cannons, because the other half of our fighter jets that still has the avalanche missiles equipped is now getting an upgrade. So once we have all five, we can head over to the hangar and start the upgrading process. And despite the lack of range compared to the missiles, the comparison here is clearly in favor of the laser cannons. Their hit chance, firing rate and armor penetration are all higher, and that in my opinion more than offsets the need to get a little closer to the enemies. 
By the way, while we're upgrading here, you may have noticed that we have not yet bought a skeleton suit, and we actually won't do that until we know what the next mission will be. Skeleton suits are not exactly cheap, and if the next mission is just a simple UFO crash, we probably won't need them, so at least for the time being, we won't use up any additional funds. And with that, five of our jets are now being upgraded, the rest of them already have the Phoenix Cannon, and I think that's fine for now. Now, at this point, we can also quickly head back to engineering and purchase three more satellites, because, as you may have seen earlier, it is already June 10th. Commander, our current satellite uplink facilities are at full capacity. We should build additional uplinks as soon as possible to allow for new satellite deployments. Now, this time we are purchasing the three satellites separately, because at this point I'm not quite sure what the panic situation will be at the end of the month, and we might end up needing all three of them or just a single one. This way we can, in theory, cancel the production of as many satellites as we need, which will then give us our funds back to spend them on more pressing issues. Alright, couple of things happening at once here. Our jets have been equipped with their laser cannons, we have finished an excavation, and we have also successfully constructed another workshop. The new engineers arrived this morning, Commander. We're always glad to have more help down here. So, with that workshop, we are now up to 42 engineers, but for what I had planned originally, that is sadly not enough. A few episodes back, I thought I would be able to build a satellite nexus this month, but as you can see here, for that one we will need 45 engineers, so for this month we will have to make do with another uplink. That one will go into that empty space next to the genetics lab, but at the moment we're actually building something else, namely the thermo generator. We have just excavated the space next to the access lift holding a steam vent, and for the somewhat hefty price tag of 200 credits we can now build a thermal generator on top of that, which will then supply us with 20 units of power. That is, just for comparison, over three times as much as a normal power generator, and because of that, in the long run it will also help us save some building space. So, construction is underway, it will now only take 8 days until the generator is finished, and we could at this point also start excavating the spot right next to it. However, for what I have planned, we don't really need that yet, and for 80 credits, the excavation is not cheap either, so we will simply leave things as they are. We will finish another excavation in a few hours over on the other side, so if we desperately need some building space, we have some available. And that's it for the time being, construction is underway, time to continue scanning. Excavation contact detected. Alright, just as the excavation finishes, we make contact with a small UFO. And our interceptors have been upgraded as well, so this one should not be too hard to take down. So let's see that new laser cannon in action. Enemy is padlocked. Nearing strike range. We only need to land two hits and the interceptor can take a bit of damage so we don't need to use the dodge module here. And as you can see, it also doesn't take long until the UFO goes down. And that means we have another mission on our hands, so let's prepare accordingly. With Roselia still in the labs, this will be our six-person squad for this one, but we also have the task to stun and capture an outsider alien. So first things first, we will have to re-equip the arc thrower on Adam. Heavy Andrea Cook can then get familiar with the new heavy laser. As you can see here, definitely an improvement over the standard LMG. Since one of the goals on this mission is to capture an alien, we will also sacrifice some accuracy for utility as we switch out Emilia's scope for a flashbang grenade. Shoji can then also equip the heavy laser while George's loadout will stay as it is, and mech trooper Nicholas Mahoney can debut the railgun on this mission. Firepower-wise, this might actually be the best weapon we currently have in our squad, and let's see if he'll be able to rack up a few more kills with it. So this is our squad and their loadout, let's see if we can win this mission and capture ourselves an outsider. This is Big Sky, we're just north of the crash site. Strike 1 is in position to engage. Loud and clear, Big Sky. We'll monitor those readings from here. Strike 1 is authorized to assault the alien craft. Alright, here we are in the woods, and since that is the usual terrain for these types of missions, I also did not buy any new skeleton suits. The skeleton suit's grappling hook is very much unnecessary for this mission, and I think we will be fine with carapace armor. 
Now, this mission also presents us with an excellent opportunity to grab some melt. We haven't done that in a while, but we are using this stuff quite frequently at the moment. It might also be a good chance for George and Nicholas to get a few more kills towards the next promotion, but first things first, we have to scout out our surroundings, and we will start doing that with Sprinter Emilia. That's what we're looking for. She discovers the first melt container with a 4 turn timer but no enemies, so I think we can risk going for the dash here and advance just a few tiles oh, further. No. The rest of the squad will then join up with her, although we don't have cover available for everyone here. But again, we haven't spotted any hostiles yet, so for this first turn we should be fine. And that's our first turn, we hear some hovering noises in the background, so we might be running into a cyber disk on this mission, although I will admit I'm not quite sure if that was in fact the noise it makes. In any case, we also have bigger concerns for the moment, because as we advance Emilia closer to the melt, she discovers two mutons. Thankfully though, their aggressive behavior moves them a bit closer towards us, which actually should make taking them out relatively easy. Moving to firing position. For the first muton on the left side, we can go with the ever-reliable run and gun. This will get assault at him work up close and into a flanking position. He also discovers the first signs of the UFO while doing so, but for now, let's focus on taking out our first hostile. And that is a lovely start, a 93% shot finds the target for a critical hit, the muton goes down and that leaves only its companion on the other side. On the move. And for this one, we will move up mech trooper Nicholas Mahoney and then use collateral damage, not necessarily to damage the muton, but to take away the half cover it's hiding behind. And there we are, the Muton takes two points of damage and is now completely exposed, and so it is now in a prime position for a headshot from Sniper George, which, if it hits, will be the guaranteed kill. kill confirmed. And that it does, another critical, another enemy down. And since we don't seem to have any more around, we can dash with our two heavies to continue the turn, and then we can put Emilia on Overwatch to finish it. Once again, we hear that hovering noise and at this point I'm pretty sure we have a cyberdisc around somewhere, so let's see what Adam can spot as he gets closer to the ship. We should make every attempt to capture one of those creatures using the arc thrower. There doesn't seem to be much left when we attack outright. Well, not the cyberdisc, but instead the outsider, and we're also immediately reminded of our quest to stun and capture one. The problem is that it is currently way out of reach of Adam's arc thrower, and we can't really get closer without exposing him too much. Still, we need the enemy to get a bit closer to us, and I think the tactical retreat might be the best way to lure it in. So Adam will run back into half cover and out of range here, while Sniper George joins him, who knows, maybe we'll need that disabling shot soon. With the rest of the squad, we could now move up Nicholas a bit to draw some fire and present a nice target, but if we do in fact have a cyberdisc floating around, it might not be too smart to expose him too early, so we will simply have him reload and hunker down with everyone else. And as I had hoped, the outsider comes closer, it moves into full cover and also takes a shot at Adam. Not quite the target I had hoped for, but with 14 hit points, he can take it. At the end of the alien's turn, we then also get a rough location of the second melt container somewhere up into the left of us, but for now we have an outsider to stun, so let's get to work. We also have some melt to collect and we can actually combine those two objectives. As we move Andrea up to the container here, grab the melt and then launch a needle grenade. This grenade does a guaranteed 4 points of damage, getting the outsider down to only 1 hit point, and there we are now, the outsider is sufficiently prepared, let's move Adam in to finish the job. However, as he moves in, he discovers what I had already feared for a few turns. There is, in fact, a cyberdisc on this map accompanied by a drone. This admittedly puts an already damaged Adam into a bit of a precarious situation, but I would say let's take things one step at a time. We came here to stun an outsider, and let's see if Adam is successful. And that he is, the outsider is stunned and captured, and we have unlocked the gatekeeper achievement. So let's briefly talk about the cyberdisc. We have already encountered one before, but that one didn't really get a chance to do much, and I am afraid that will be a little different this time. 
Additionally, the Cyberdisc is accompanied by a drone with the ability to repair it, although apart from the fact that it's flying and therefore a little harder to hit, the drone otherwise does not pose too much of a threat. The Cyberdisc, on the other hand, does have a pretty powerful main weapon, and it also has access to alien grenades, which it can lob over quite a bit of distance, so we probably don't want to cluster our squad too closely together. Now, first of all, we will actually try to take out the drone here, because it can revert much of the damage we do to the Cyberdisc, and we will start things off with Shoji, because his holo targeting ability will improve the aim chances of everyone else. Okay, I had not expected that. Despite a 60% hit chance, Shoji hits for maximum damage and immediately destroys the drone, and this does in fact make things a little easier. Now, moving on, we will move Sniper George Teasdale a few steps over to the left here, where he has a clear line of fire, and then we'll take an 85% shot at the target. Alright, I think that evens out Shoji's hit from just a moment ago, as for some reason, George's 85% shot goes wide. Now, at this point, we will move up Nicholas to present a bit of a target, because we definitely do not want the Cyberdisc to focus its attention on an already damaged Adam. Nicholas can also take a 65% shot, but that one goes wide as well, and so the only thing we have left to do at this point is to provide some extra protection with a smoke grenade from Emilia. Emilia herself is pretty far away, so I hope she doesn't get targeted, and George will also stay out of the cloud because he already has full cover. Now it's the Cyberdisc's turn, and it does in fact use its turn to move, and then it also targets Emilia. Luckily though, its shot misses, because any sort of critical hit could have been the instant kill here, but instead, Emilia does not suffer a single scratch, and now it's our turn, and we should be able to take the Cyberdisc out right here and now. We start things off with a Shredder Rocket from Andrea, which will not only do 6 points of damage because of her heat ammo ability, but which will also increase the damage output of all subsequent attacks. And that is quite useful, because our next attack is another rocket, this time from Shoji, and with the bonus applied, this one will do a full 10 points of damage. That brings the Cyberdisc down to only 4 HP, and I would say it's time for George to make up for his mistake earlier. Let's see if he can hit the target this time. He's down. Another day, another successful operation. Okay, that is somewhat surprising. A fairly short mission here with only 5 enemies, but at least we didn't have to look for another melt container. George also came through when it mattered, and most importantly, we got what we came for. We have successfully stunned an outsider. So, let's return to the base and see what that gets us. Is that all that's left of the specimen we attempted to capture? Yes. I believe we may have found the source of the strange readings we picked up when we first encountered it. What is it, Doctor? We're not exactly sure. It's organic in nature, yet highly magnetized, and it appears to resonate very faintly within a specific electromagnetic spectrum. It is currently unclear how or... Perhaps that's because this is outside your field of expertise, Doctor. If what you're saying is true, this object is an antenna. One that's receiving a signal. That signal? Can we trace it? No. At least not yet. We would first need to determine its encryption algorithm. My team can handle that. In that case, I will focus on constructing an interface between this object and our global communications array, which we'll need to trace the signal. Then it looks like researching this crystal should be our top priority. Okay, the main quest line progresses, but for now we have another promotion to take care of. Our mech trooper Nicholas Mahoney has advanced to the rank of Major, and as a result he unlocks the Overdrive ability. That means he can now shoot and then move, shoot and reload, or maybe even shoot twice per turn, and considering his brand new shiny weapon, he will certainly find some use for that ability. 
Now from this mission we have unlocked a few new research projects. The Outsider Shard, which we just saw in the cutscene earlier, is only one of them. But from stunning the Outsider we have also recovered a light plasma rifle, which we cannot use until we have researched it. And killing the drone has also unlocked the drone autopsy. Otherwise, the loot here is pretty standard for a UFO mission. As always, we also recover some damaged goods, but those will fetch a nice price on the grey market. So here we are, another mission is completed and we will actually pay a quick visit to the research labs next, because, as you know, we can complete autopsies instantly. So let's see what we can learn from disassembling the drone here. This unit appears to be a drone, which is similar to the military drones we are familiar with. This particular example seems to have the ability to repair damaged equipment. Dr. Shen and I believe it should be possible to capture and repurpose these for our own use in the field. Okay, nothing that will help us right away, but we have unlocked two new foundry projects. The first one here being the drone capture. A project that when completed will upgrade the arc throwers so that they can not only stun aliens but also take control of enemy drones. The usefulness of this upgrade is of course very situational. The other project is then the Sentinel drone, which is once again an upgrade for the heavy weapons platform. Should we ever construct one, this would grant it self-healing capabilities, and those are pretty much always a good thing to have. Now, as you can see here, the Outsider Shard Priority Project and the Light Plasma Rifle have been added to our research project list, but once again we will take things one step at a time and continue with what we have been doing so far, and that is further researching the UFO power source. Afterwards we can then get ourselves a bit more cash from the grey market by selling the damaged power source and flight computer. That will boost our bank account by 50 credits and those might be useful, as they would for example be able to fund another Exalt scan this month. For now though, the completion of another gene modification is waiting, so as always, let's continue scanning. The adrenaline spike caused by killing an enemy can now be channeled into a hormone cloud, making it contagious. And there we are, Resilience has now received his second gene modification as well, so it probably won't take long until we see him back in action. And since we have just completed a mission and will hopefully not run into another one for the next three days, our next candidate for gene modification will actually be Emilia. That encounter with the Cyberdisc was a bit too close for comfort in my opinion, because together with Andrea, Emilia is one of the two soldiers who I would like to have survive until the end of the game, so let's improve her healing abilities with adaptive bone marrow. I will also admit I kind of misunderstood this modification in the last episode, because of course the self-healing abilities provided by this modification also work with armor, they are simply not able to heal any hit points that are normally provided by armor. So in Emilia's case she would be able to heal back up to 7 hit points, everything after that is armor and can therefore not be healed. Excellent. We'll begin prepping the candidate for surgery immediately. I will notify you when the genetic modification process is completed. And with Emilia undergoing modification, we can now continue scanning and hope that we don't run into another mission until she's done. Alright, looking good here, Emilia's gene modification has been completed and we have also finished the research of the UFO power source. As a result, we can now construct a brand new facility in the Illyrium generator and we can also upgrade the armor of all of our mech troopers. Now first of all, let's have a quick look at the Illyrium generator. This one is even more powerful than the thermo generator as it supplies 30 units of power. However, it is also pretty expensive to construct and therefore it is a facility that we will likely not construct right away. Still, just like the thermo generator, it can help free up some space around the base as constructing one might make a few of the regular generators obsolete. Now very interesting is then the new mech here, the Mech 2 Sentinel, which is basically the level 2 version of the mech armor. And just like the level 1 version had us choose between the kinetic strike module and the flamethrower, this one also gives us a choice, only this time we can choose between the grenade launcher and restorative mist. I think we'll talk a bit more about that in the next episode, for now we can simply be happy that we have unlocked it, and we will actually also leave the research screen B for a few seconds here, and instead we hop back over to the gene labs. Now I think it would be pretty risky to send Emilia away for another 3 days here, so instead the next soldier receiving a modification, that will be Adam. And the modification for him, that will be hyperreactive pupils, because whenever Adam takes a shot he normally does so using rapid fire, and if the first shot misses, this modification makes it a bit more likely that the second one hits. This also helps a bit to offset the aim penalty that is given for using rapid fire, at least for the second shot if the first one does not already connect. 
Thank you, Commander. I'll have the volunteer prepped and ready for surgery shortly. I'll send word when the procedure is complete. So with Adam in the lab, we can now jump back to research and at this point I would like to hear what you think. Now we have several options here and all of them are pretty intriguing. We could push forward the game's main questline by researching the Outsider Shard, which would only take three days, and which will unlock a unique but also rather challenging mission. Alternatively, we could focus on improving our air support by researching a brand new fighter craft, which we will definitely need sooner or later as we run into some of the bigger UFOs in the game. Still, completing that research project also takes quite a while and eventually purchasing one of those new fighter crafts is also very expensive, so I'm not quite sure if it's worth it this early in the game. We could also research the plasma pistol or the plasma rifle and upgrade our field weaponry a bit further that way, but again, both of those projects are also rather time consuming. So the outsider shot is definitely the quickest project to complete, but on the other hand also the one that we can pretty much postpone indefinitely. Of course, the mission it eventually unlocks will not become any easier the longer we wait, but since one of the rewards for that mission is actually a worldwide one-point panic reduction, we might want to wait with this mission until we really need that panic relief. For example, if we do it strategically at the very end of this month, it could actually allow us to not have to launch a single satellite and still keep every single country in the XCOM project, which would definitely also help out our finances quite a bit. But again, there are arguments to be made for most of the other projects here as well, so again, let me know what you think in the comments below. And with that, we have actually also reached the point where we make the cut in today's episode. I hope that, despite the rather short mission, you have enjoyed this video, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course either subscribe or check out and maybe pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.